Our first two examples of greedy algorithms were in the realm of scheduling. Now, first of all, you should not assume that all scheduling algorithms have greedy solutions. There are other types of scheduling algorithms which do not have greedy solutions. So it very much depends on what criterion you're trying to optimize. So the kinds of criteria we used admitted greedy algorithms, but others may not. But now we will change focus and look at a different domain. And this domain is that of uh, communication. So we are going to look at efficient communication. So when we communicate, when we send a WhatsApp or a message or an email, we are communicating in some language, right? So it could be English or Hindi or Tamil or any other language. And each language has its own alphabet, right? Its own set of symbols that need to be sent. So when I read an English message, I read certain letters. If I read a Hindi message, I would be reading Devanagari. It's a different character set. But as we all know, this whole communication happens digitally. And in digital communication, the only thing that gets transmitted from the sender to the receiver is a sequence of zeros and ones. So we have these symbols which are meaningful to us, A, B, C, D, K, K, G, G, and all that. But they are actually being transmitted as zeros and ones. So therefore, there must be some encoding. Right? There must be some way of taking the letters or symbols that we need in our natural language and writing it as a sequence of zeros and ones so that at the other end, we can transform it backwards from the zero one sequence to the letters and read it. So, for instance, let's take a very simple case. Supposing we just take the lowercase letters A to Z in English, in the Roman alphabet, which is what we use for English. So, as we all know, there are 26 letters in this alphabet. Now, if we want to take 26 different characters and encode them using binary strings, we cannot make do with four bits or four binary digits because with four binary digits, we can only create two to the four or 16 combinations. So, two to the four is too small. So the next power of 2, if I go to 5 bits, is 2 to the 5 is 32. So with 32 combinations, I can use 26 of them for my letters and I have 6 spare. Okay? But so I need, if I use this encoding, I need to use 5 bits for each letter and each letter will be denoted obviously by a different sequence of 5 bits. So the question about efficient communication is, is there some way to do better than this? obvious approach. So the obvious approach says take the size of your symbol set or alphabet, see which power of 2 is the smallest power which exceeds that and use that many bits. So now I will get a message which will, I will break up into sequences of 5 bits each and each 5 bits will be a valid letter and I will be able to recover it. So the intuition is that not all letters are used as frequently as each other. So some letters happen more frequently. So if you play a game like Scrabble, for instance, you will know that some letters in the Scrabble board have lower points and they also occur in the set with more frequency. So there are letters like E, which for instance, there are more E's because you need it to make more words. Whereas letters like Q and Z, which are rare, have higher points, but you also get only one of them in the set. So there is a natural frequency with each letter depending on the language. So English has a different frequency, German has a different frequency. So even uh, languages which use the same underlying set of letters may not have the same frequency because of the vocabulary. And of course in Devanagari, if you are using Hindi or Marathi, you might see a different frequency of the letters that are there. So the idea for optimization is take those letters which occur very frequently and try to use shorter codes. And those letters which occur more rarely use longer codes because you will use them only once in a while. So it's okay to spend a few more bits transmitting them. So this takes us from what we call a fixed length coding. So this is a fixed length coding. Right? So every letter was encoded using uh, 5 bits. Now we go to a variable length coding. And one of the earliest and most well-known variable length encoding is the one that was used originally in telegrams. It's called Morse code. So in Morse code, everything is encoded as dots and dashes. So this was a physical device. So you, if you pressed it lightly, you get a dot. If you press it for a longer time, you get a dash. Right? So it's like analogous to sending zeros and ones. You have two symbols, dot and dash. So if you look at the Morse code, you can look it up on Wikipedia or somewhere, you will see that the encoding of E is a dot. The encoding of T is a dash. So in our translation here, E is a 0 and T is a 1 because for us 0 is a dot and 1 is a dash. And A, for instance, is a dot followed by a dash. So A would be 0, 1. 
So now let's look at one difficulty that we have with this variable length coding. So supposing at the other end I receive the sequence 0101. Now my next job is to decode what the sequence was. So I have to transform it back into these letters. So if I look at 0101, I can see that A is 01. So I can decode it as A followed by A. But notice that this is not the only thing because I could also break it up as A followed by E followed by T, for example, right? So I can get A, E, T. Or I can say that this is, these two are both E's and these are T's. Or I can say that this is an A and this is an E and so there are all kinds of in interpretations of this because it is not very clear where the boundaries of the letters are. When we are doing a fixed length -like coding, we know that every 5 bits constitutes a letter. So I can just break it up into blocks of the same size and decode each block. Now the blocks are of different lengths, I need to know where the block boundaries are. So what does Morse code do? Well Morse code actually uses a subtle thing, so it, there is a kind of a a gap. So a Morse operator who is sending Morse code will actually press a dot for an E and then wait, press a dot, dash for a T and then wait and then quickly press a dot and a dash and then wait. So there is a pause. So implicitly actually there is a third letter which is giving you these boundaries. So it is not a two letter encoding but a three letter encoding because there is a pause which you can interpret as an extra letter telling you where the boundaries between the encodings of zeros and ones are. So we are working with a two letter encoding, right? so that won't work for us. So what we really want to make sure is that we have this unambiguous way of taking an encoded sequence of zeros and ones and recovering what we started with. So for this, what we want to make sure is that when we are processing a sequence, at any point we are not unsure, right? So here this is the problem, right? If I read this zero, at this point it could be an E or it could be that I have to read the 1 and make it an A, right? So the problem is that I, when I finish reading the 0, I am not sure whether the letter is over, is it an E or the letter is not over. So we do not want this kind of a situation where the code for one letter is included as the beginning of the code for another letter. So it is called a prefix, right? So what we want really is a code, an encoding where for any x, if I take the encoding of x, it is not the prefix of encoding of any other y. So when I see x as my encoded letter, I am guaranteed that this is correct. I can stop here and then extract those letters and not proceed, right? So in our case, as we said, the encoding of E in Morse code is 0 and the encoding of A is 0, 1. So if I look at a prefix of this, I get the encoding of E, right? So this is not a prefix code. A prefix code is a code in which I never have this kind of overlap. I do not have any letter which is a prefix of another letter after the encoding. So here is a, an example of a prefix code. So if I look at this for instance, there is, so, so 0 could be 0, 01 or 0, 0, 0, or 0, 0, 001. So that means that there is no letter which I can encode with just 0. Because if I read just 0 and if I can stop, then I do not know whether I should wait or not. So you can see that 1, 1 is not a prefix of anything, 0, 1 is not a prefix of anything. If I have 0, 0, then I cannot stop because I must go to 0, 0, 1 or 0, 0, 0. So this is an example of a prefix code. And when you have a prefix code, right, now if I give you a sequence of letters like this, it is quite easy because I can start with this. I can say, okay, 0 does not correspond to anything, 0, 0 does not correspond to anything, 0, 0, 1 does correspond to something. So this must be a boundary. So I can do this and say that the first letter must be a C. Now again I can start from here and do the same thing and I will find that at 0, 0, 0, that is the first time I hit a boundary where I have a valid encoding, so that must be an E. And then again I have a 0, 0, 1 which is a C, and then I have a 1, 1 which is an A and a 0, 1 which is a B. So if I have a prefix code, then every time I see the encoding of a complete letter, I can break it off and say, okay, now I have seen this letter and I can read off the thing unambiguously. There is no two ways of decoding this code. So that is the kind of code that we want. Now our goal, if you remember, was to find encodings which reduce the total number of bits that we send. We said that we have a frequent, if we have this fixed length encoding, we are going to send 5 bits per letter, okay? But if we have more frequent and less frequent letters, it may be a good idea to vary the length so that the more frequent letters have shorter encodings and the less frequent letters have longer encodings. So that was the whole point of going to prefix codes. So what we are really interested in is building some kind of an optimal prefix code, a prefix code which will use as few let 
bits as possible when transmitting a message. So, the first step is to measure the frequency, right. So, we need to know each symbol that we are going to encode, how frequent it is. So, we have to measure the frequency of every letter in our alphabet. So, how do you measure the frequency? Well, the standard way to measure the frequency is to just take a large set of documents, right. So, you could go to a library. Of course, nowadays it is easier because if the things are digitized, you do not have to count by hand. You can use your uh, a program to count it, but you will count all the letters. You will see how many letters there are across all these books. And then you will see of this how many are A's, how many are B's, how many are C's. So, all the letters which are of interest to you, you will count them and establish their frequency as a fraction. The number of times you see an A divided by the total number of letters A to Z, number of times you see and so on. So, this is our fraction. So, this we will call f of x, right. So, if I have a, an alphabet with n letters in it, x1 to xn, then each of these letters will have a frequency. And because it is a fraction of the total number of letters that appears across all the documents that I have counted, these fractions will add up to 1, right. So, if you remember in probability, this is how it works. You have a probability assigned to each uh, event and the total sum of the probabilities is 1 and each probability is between 0 and 1. So, you can think of f of x1 as the probability that a given letter is x1 because this is the frequency with which x1 turns up. So, if I am just generating letters at random, right, then x1 will turn up with probability f of x1. Now, this probability is of course, estimated from the documents that I read. If I read a different set of documents, it might change. And as we already said, it may vary from language to language. So, if I read a set of English documents, the frequency of the letters may be different from a set of French documents or a set of documents in some other language which uses the same alphabet. So, if we look at our uh, message, so now there is an unfortunate thing here. So, let us, so this n is not the same as that n, I will fix it later on, okay. So, let us now use small n for the total length of the message. So, we are sending a message, right. So, we are sending a message in English or Hindi or Tamil and that message has so many characters in the source language, in the, in the language we are trying to send. Now, each letter in our source language appears this many times, right, the, its frequency times n. So, if for example, uh, letter x1 has a frequency of 0.1, it means that one tenth of every message will have x1. So, if I have a 100 letters in my message, then 10 of them will be x1. So, that is what we are saying. You take the frequency, it is a fraction, multiply it by the length of the message, you will get the total number of times that particular letter occurs. So, we now are trying to construct this encoding. So, we are wondering ab about how many bits I eventually use to send my message m. So, each letter in our encoding has a representation in 0, 1, which we write capital E of x. So, x like a or b or c is denoted by 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 and so on, that is E of x. So, each letter is blown up by the length of its encoding, right. So, every time I see an a, I will replace it by the string representing a in binary. So, each symbol, single symbol a will be blown up to three symbols or four symbols or whatever it is that I have. So, if I look at the total length of my message now, it is going to be the number of letters, okay, times the frequency of the letter. So, this together tells us the number of times x occurs, okay, times the length of So, if I look at a n times the frequency of a will tell me how many a's there are multiplied by the number of bits I use to a, then b times the frequency of b will tell me how many b's there are, then the times the length of the b and then n times the frequency of c and so on and there is add it up. So, this is my total message length and if I take the total message length, this gives me the overall number of bits, right. So, I use so many bits overall and I have by assumption small n letters encoded. So, if I divide by n, I will get the average, right. So, the average is just this part the summation of f x e x. The other way is that is why you can think of it as a probability. If you remember probability, this is the expectation. The expectation is the probability of each event times the event itself, right. So, this is the probability times the length of that thing. So, this is what we really want to think about. How many bits on an average are we using per letter in our encoding? So, let us look at a concrete example to understand this. So, let us take this uh, uh, earlier encoding that we had. So, we had come up with a kind of just to show what a code looked like, we had come up with this encoding, right. So, this is the same encoding, but now we also have to associate some frequencies. So, I am just putting some random frequencies that add up to 1. So, you can just check that this adds up to 1, right. 
So, if I take this, then I need to assign to each of these, I, I mean, so the length is clear, right? So, the length is 2, 2, 3, 2, 3. So, if I want to compute now how many bits I will take for a message, what we said is that we will have to basically go back and just, so it does not matter how long the message is because I can divide by n, right? So, I can get to this. I just want to take the average by taking the number of the frequency of each letter times its length. So, if I take this, I have 0.32 times 2 from this, from this part, then I have 0.25 times 2, then I have 0.2 times 3, 0.18 times 2 and 0 0.05 times 3, right? And if I add this up, this comes to 2.25. So, what this is saying is that if I use this particular encoding for this and assuming, so it is always assuming the frequencies, if I assume this is the frequency and this is the encoding, then I am going to be using on an average 2.25 bits per letter, right? And remember that if I wanted a fixed length encoding, I have to use as many bits as I need to cross 5. So, I cannot use just 2 bits because if I have only 2 bits, I can only encode 4 letters. So, I am forced to use 3 bits. So, in a fixed length encoding, I would be using 3 bits per letter. Here, I am using 2.25 bits per letter. So, by going to this variable en length encoding, on the length of the message, I am reducing it by 1 fourth, right? 0 0.75 by 3. So, 25 percent saving in terms of the cost of transmission. But the problem is that this choice of encoding is not fixed and there may be a better one, right? So, here is a better one. So, I have just permuted this row here a little bit, right? So, in some sense, the A and the E are the same as before, but these three values have now been shuffled. So, in particular, I have moved uh, the long sequence from C to D, okay? And there is a reason to do that because you can see that D has a lower frequency than C. So, it makes sense from our intuition that you should use a longer sequence to represent lower frequency letters. And indeed, if you calculate the same quantity, this quantity, if you calculate it now for the new thing, it turns out to reduce from 2.25 to 2.23, right? Now, 2.23 is per letter. So, you can imagine that if we send a message which has got thousands of letters, there is a substantial saving, even though the saving per letter has only come down by 0 0.02. So, this is our goal then. Our goal is that we are given this table, we are given this row and this row, right? We are given the letters and from some experimental evidence, we are given the frequencies and our goal is to find this best encoding, right? And the best encoding is defined in terms of this average bits per letter, which we will call ABL. So, given an alphabet and with this associated frequency information, compute an encoding which minimizes ABL, right? This is our goal. So, to do this, we will first look at our codes as binary trees. So, here is the encoding that we had before and here is a binary tree. Now, how does this binary tree represent it? Well, first of all, as you can see, the letters are sitting at the leaves of the tree, okay? So, that is one part of it. So, the letters are at the leaves of the tree. And now, how do you read off the code? Well, you read off the code by actually looking at the path from the root. So, if I, if, if I name these as 0 for left and 1 for right, right? Then 1, 1 takes me to A. So, the code for A is 1, 1, right? 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1 takes me to D. So, the code for D is 0, 0, 1. So, in that sense, the paths of this binary tree represent the sequence of letters which encode that letter at the leaf. And there is nothing in the middle, right? And why is there nothing in the middle? Because if I had something here, if supposing I use this to encode F, then that would mean that the encoding 0 represents F, but then if I extend the encoding to 0, 1, it represents C. So, this is not a prefix code anymore. So, by ensuring that all the encoded values are sitting at the leaves, no encoding leads to another encoding. I mean, I do not have an encoding sitting below another encoding, which is the same as saying that no encoding is a prefix of the other encoding. So, there are no internal nodes in this tree which encode letters. So, we will reason about our codes using this representation because it is easier to prove things about this representation. So, the first observation is that this tree will always be full. Now, full is something we have not seen before, we have seen complete. So, complete binary tree is one where every level is filled, right? And then we saw this heap kind of thing where we fill level by level. Now, full is something which is not 
complete and it is not like a heap, it is not necessarily filled level by level, but it has a property that I never have one child, right. So, I cannot have just one thing sticking off here, this is not full, right. So, so why is it that any optimal tree must be full? Well, imagine that I had only one child, right. So, supposing I have a situation where at some point I have only one child and then below that I have something, right. So, this node has only one child. But then if it has only one child, if you remember we did this also when we did a delete for a binary search tree, I could as well move this whole thing up and nothing will change, right. So, if I have only one child, I can promote that child and replace the node above by the child node and I will get a shorter tree, right and nothing else will change because there was no other child. So, no path is getting confused by this. So, I will end up with a valid encoding which has shorter paths to some of the letters. So, shorter encodings for some of the letters, so I might as well use it. So, every optimal prefix code must be full because otherwise I could make it more optimal by reducing the path lengths. Now, second thing is that if I take two leaves, if I take a leaf like this and if I take a leaf like this, then C is some sense is higher than E, okay. So, if depending on which you are thinking about it, usually we talk about the depth. So, we start from the root and come down. So, the depth of C is smaller than the depth of E and what we would like to claim is that things which are at a smaller depth, which are higher in the tree, they have shorter encodings and if they have shorter encodings, they must have higher frequencies, right. So, what we claim is that if your tree is optimal and x is sitting higher than y, then it must have a frequency which is bigger than y. It cannot have a smaller frequency than y, right. And the reason is simple because if in fact it was the case that f of c, right, is smaller than f of e, right. So, c has a shorter encoding, e has a longer encoding but f is actually, c is actually less frequent than e, then I could just swap these two labels, right. And if I swap these two labels in that formula, you will see that the multiplication now is multiplied by a, a different frequency which brings it down, right. So, if I exchange the labels, that average, average bit length will have to improve. So, this is the second claim. Now, the third claim is that if something is at maximal depth, is a leaf at maximum depth, then it must also have a leaf on its side. So, for example, this is a leaf whose partner, who, whose sibling is not a leaf, but C is not at maximum depth, say the maximum depth is here and here this has another leaf here. Now, this is obvious because if this thing does not have a partner which is a leaf, then that must have two children because remember this is a full tree, right. So, if it has a partner that is not a leaf, it must have children, but then those children must eventually lead to leaves which are further down. So, those leaves which are further down will be deeper than the leaf that we started with and we were only talking about leaves at maximum depth, right. So, if I am at maximum depth and if I am a leaf, then my partner is also a leaf, that is a very simple statement, okay. So, we have these three claims, right. So, every optimum prefix tree must be a full tree, every node has 0 or 2 children. If I have a leaf which is higher than another leaf, then the frequency of this leaf cannot be smaller than this one, right. It must be greater than or equal to. And the third thing says that a leaf at the bottom most level must be paired with another leaf. So, this gives us enough to construct a tree, optimum tree recursively. So, how does it work, right? So, the first thing is that we, we, <coughs> so this should be claim 3, I think. Right. So, from claim 3, we know that at the bottom most level of the tree, we have pairs of leaves. Now, those leaves at the bottom most level of the tree must have the lowest frequencies among all the leaves. They cannot have higher frequency than anything which is higher, right. So, remember that this will always be 3, I will fix it later. So, so now these must be the lowest frequency. So, basically I can target that. I can say that, okay, push the lowest frequency letters to the bottom of the tree. So, what I will do is I will pick the two letters x and y which have the smallest fx and fy, the smallest frequencies in my alphabet and I will assign them in principle to the bottom. But the way I will do it is, I mean I am going to actually build up this thing recursively. So, I in, in principle these have to go to the bottom. So, let us assume that they are assigned to the bottom. So, now I have to process the rest of the tree and how do I process the rest of the tree? Well, I pretend that these two have been processed. So, I pretend that these two have been processed by combining them into a single node 
which, which represents both x and y. So, I will call it a compound letter x, y. So, x, y is a new letter which stands for a combination of x and y. So, basically we are saying that at the bottom we are assuming now that we have something like this, right. So, we are going to pretend that instead of this we have something like this. And what is going to be the frequency of this x, y? Well, x, y has to combine how many times x occurs and how many times y occurs. So, it is going to have a frequency of f x plus f y. So, what I have done is I have taken my original alphabet, right, and I have removed these two nodes corresponding to two letters x and y with smallest frequency and replaced them by a letter, a kind of fictitious compound letter x, y whose frequency is the sum of the two. So, I have transformed my alphabet into something with one letter less, right. So, a prime has a minus x comma y plus the new letter x y. Now, if I have a smaller alphabet, I will just assume that I can solve the smaller alphabet, right. So, we will see what is the base case. The base case is when your alphabet has only two letters. When you have only two letters, then you have no choice, right. So, you have two letters. So, you will just put say x 1 and x 2. Right. So, this is my smallest encoding that I can do, take two letters and call one 0 and call one, the other one 1 in terms of the representation in binary. So, I will just keep going down. So, I will start with n letters, go down to n minus 1 letters, n minus 2 letters. When I get two letters, I have a trivial tree and now I have to go back. Right. So, this is the point. So, the recursion has to be unraveled. So, in this recursive solution which I have just constructed, right. So, I had added this letter x, y, okay, and the rest of the tree is sitting here. Now, I do not know what the rest of the tree looks like, but certainly there will be, because I am solving it for this alphabet, right, there has to be a leaf labeled x, y. So, I will take that leaf labeled x, y, right, and I will expand it by, I will reverse the process. What did I do earlier? I, I took this, right, and I imagined that I had done this. So, I will now do this in reverse. I will take that leaf and replace it by an internal node and two children labeled x and y, right. So, this is the recursive algorithm and this is called Huffman coding after the person who discovered or invented it called David Huffman. So, let us see how this algorithm works to get an idea about what it is doing. So, supposing we have that original example that we had constructed, but now, I am only recording the frequencies, right. I am not assuming the encoding because I have to discover the encoding. So, these are my letters and this is the frequency. This is the same table that we had earlier. So, you can go back and check that, right. So, sorry. So, this is the same frequency table I had here 0 0.32, 0 0.25, 0 0.2, 0 0.18, 0 0.05, right. So, now I have this frequency table. Now, what I will do is I will look for the two smallest letters, right. So, two smallest letters here are D and E, right. So, I will combine D and E as a single letter D E and I will reconstruct this table where I have one letter less. I remove D and E separately and I produce a new compound letter called D E which is of frequency 0 0.18 plus 0 0.05 which is 0 0.23, right. Now, I do the same thing. Now, I look in this and I see which are the two smallest. I find that this and this are the two smallest right among the frequencies that I have now got. So, I will combine the letter C with this compound letter D E and I will create a new compound letter which I will call C D E and its frequency is going to be the sum of these two. It is going to be 0 0.2 plus 0 0.23. So, it is going to be 0 0.43. Now, if I look at this, I find that these two are the two smallest letters, right. So, I will now combine A and B as the letter A B. Now, I have reached an alphabet Okay, a new alphabet which has come down to two letters. There is a letter called AB and there is a letter called CDE. But in this compound sense, if I do not care what the letters are called, there are only two letters. So, this is my base case, right. So, in the base case, I can build a tree. And what does the tree look like? It just looks like a root node with two children. So, 0 encodes in, I mean, I can choose either order, it does not matter. 0 encodes AB, 1 encodes CDE. I could do it the other way around also. Now, I have to unravel this recursion. So, I have to take the last thing I did. The last thing I did was to combine A and B into A, B. So, I will now take that leaf node. Remember what it said in T prime, you take the leaf node labeled x, y and you split it as two new leaves called x and y. So, I will basically split this compound leaf so that A, B which was here, right, is now replaced by two new leaves below it called A and B. Now, if I look at this step, the next thing I did was CDE. So, I have to take this letter and split it. Right? 
So I split this letter and again I can do it left or right, it does not matter. I could have also done D, E and C, it does not really matter how I do it. Right? Finally, the optimum code will be up to this 0, 1 relabeling. So there is no clear reason why one is better than the other, but I just create two children based on the what I had combined. And then in the final step, I split this DE because that was the first thing I do. So I split this DE and I get this code. Now, earlier, if you recall, we had a reversed encoding of this, right? So the earlier encoding of this was actually optimum, but we had done the encoding in reverse. So we had actually split it from right to left rather than left to right. But this is exactly the same encoding, except that every 0 is a 1 and every 1 is a 0. This is what we were working with before. Right? So that is actually that 2.23 which we found was actually an optimum encoding okay? and this is how the algorithm would find it. So now the question is why is this optimum? Right? So this is how the algorithm works but like any greedy thing which is, so here why is greedy because at every point we are just taking the two letters which have the current lowest frequency and we are combining them without asking whether anything better is possible. So the optimality of this is by induction on the size of the alphabet. So as we said, if you have only two letters in your alphabet, there is nothing much you can do, right? You can just split them into two leaves and call them one of them 0, one of them 1. So that is optimal. Now let us assume that for any alphabet of size k minus 1, our algorithm produces an optimal tree. And now I am working with a tree of size, alphabet of size k. So the algorithm says combine the two letters of lowest frequency, construct a tree for the smaller alphabet which by induction is going to be optimal and expand the leaf to get t. Right? So the question is what happens when I expand this leaf? So the claim is that the bit length of this expanded t is exactly the bit length of the old, the optimal t prime which I got in the recursive thing plus the combined frequency of this new letter which I have combined and then destroyed f of xy. Remember f of xy is fx plus fy. Right? So this is, a, this is saying that after I split this tree, of course the path length to those new letters is one more than it was before. So the average bit length is going to increase and how much is it going to increase? It is going to increase precisely as fx plus fy, okay, which is the same as fxy. So notice that nothing else changes, right? The tree otherwise was untouched. So the only difference is that I take out, so I have this xy, right? So I will remove it and instead I will put an x and a y below it. So this is the only change that happens. So I am going to subtract from the bit length the contribution of the letter xy that I had before. And that xy, remember depth is a proxy for the path length which is a proxy for the encoding length. So if it, something is at depth 1, it is 1 bit, if it is at depth 3, it is 3 bits and so on. So if I take depth of the letter encoding xy times the frequency of xy, that is the bit length of that hypothetical letter xy which was contributing to the average bit length of t prime. Now I am going to remove that node, so that is no longer there and instead I am going to have two new contributions which is the depth of y times the encoding of y and I mean the depth of y times the frequency of y and the depth of x times the frequency of x. But these are all connected, right? The frequency of xy is just the frequency of x plus the frequency of y. That is how we defined it. And the depth is now exactly increasing by 1, right? So I am removing, let me call it d, d of xy times f of xy, right? And I am adding instead d of x, f of x plus d of y, f of y, right? So this is d of, uh, sorry, this is f of x plus f of y, right? And this is 1 plus d of x, y. This is 1 plus d of x, y, right? So I am going to cancel d of x y f of x, d of x y f of x, right? I am similarly going to cancel d of x y f of y and d of y, uh, d of x y f of y, right? So what I am left with is one copy of f x and one copy of f y and that is precisely f x plus f y. So this is what is being added back and f x plus f y is just f of x y. So if you work it out for yourself, you can see that by subtracting depth of xy times f of xy and adding back depth of x times f of x plus depth of y times f of y, the net change is f of xy, right? So the net increases f of x plus f of y which is f of xy. 
right? So this is what we have. Now we have to somehow argue. So all we can show by induction is that this tree was optimal. So why is this tree that I have got by doing this reverse transformation optimal? So let us assume that we have some optimal tree S for the current alphabet, right? And let us assume that that tree is better than the tree that I just constructed. So its average bit length is strictly less than average bit length of t. Now in that tree, the leaves could have any arbitrary label, but I know that the lowest leaf labels will have the lowest frequencies. So they could be paired in different ways, right? So if I have four labels, right, I could have A, B, C, D like this, but I could also write A, C, B, D and this would have the same bit length. Right? If I just exchange the labels at equal depth, there will be no change, no change in the bit length. So it could be that S has some arbitrary way in which it has done it, but I can always shuffle it around at keeping things at the same level and I know that my X and Y, the ones I am interested in, must be at the lowest level. So I can bring them together at the lowest level because they occur in pairs. So I will take S and I will first rearrange the leaves at the lowest level so that X and Y come together. Right? Having got them together in that tree, S, I will merge that exactly as I did here, but I am not making it a recursive call. I am physically taking S, the tree S, right, and I am looking at the leaf X, Y, and uh, sorry, the leaves X and Y, right, and I am merging these into a single new leaf called X, Y. So I am going to contract these. So I get a tree S prime, right. So I have taken an optimum, alleged optimum tree S for A. I have found a leaf in it which is called x and a leaf called y which are siblings and I have merged them to form a new node called x, y. So now this is a tree s prime which is a code encoding of a smaller alphabet, this smaller alphabet a prime, right. So s prime is over a prime but a prime we already have an optimal thing, right. t prime is already known to be optimal by induction for a prime. So s prime cannot be bigger than t, s prime cannot be smaller than t prime, right. So it must be that the average bit length of T prime, the known optimum is at least as good as that of S prime, right. So, so that means that if I look at the difference between S and S prime, it is going to be by the same calculation, the same as the difference between T and T prime, namely f of x, y, right. This, this, this claim holds for S and S prime because I have done exactly the same operation and therefore it means that if this is smaller than this, then this must also be smaller than that. So the T that I constructed cannot be worse than the S that I constructed. So this assumption that I have a strictly better S is wrong, right. So that is the proof of optimality by induction. So how would you implement this? Well, what we have to do is we have to keep looking for these two letters of minimum frequency and replace them with a combined letter of composite letters of combined frequency. And if you do this naively, then you will have to scan the frequencies, find the two minimum, minimum and second minimum and combine them, add them and put them back, right. So this will take a linear time to scan and we do this, we have to keep shrinking by one. So we have uh, the, the time, I mean we do linear scan and everything, overall is going to be a quadratic algorithm, okay. Now as you might guess, whenever we need to find repeatedly find the minimum and then replace it back with something else and keep maintaining the minimum, the correct thing to do is a heap. So if we keep the frequencies of the letters in a heap, then finding the two minimum is doing deletement twice, which is a logarithmic operation and then you insert back an element with the sum of the frequencies, that is also logarithmic. So every up, update is logarithmic, so overall you can move from k squared to k log k. And of course, then you have to also keep track of the labeling and all that, but that is very easy to do once you have got this choice fixed properly. So why is this a greedy algorithm? It is a greedy algorithm because we are making this choice locally, right? Every point when we have an alphabet with frequencies, we are finding the two minimum ones, combining them and we are never going to go back and combine letters in any other way. So those two will be siblings forever, right? So that is something which we do not go back and do. So it is a very local choice, it is a locally optimum choice which we never revisit, we never go back. So it follows our classical uh, paradigm that we have shown, shown, seen for greedy, that is we have a number of choices and we make one based on some local heuristic and we stick with that. So this problem actually has an interesting history, so I will just conclude with that. So this idea about 
encoding things optimally is actually the subject of a very interesting area called information theory, which was invented by Claude Shannon uh, around the end of the Second World War. And it was intimately tied to the rise of radio and telecommunications because at that time people were seriously being becoming interested in transmitting messages over long distances and trying to minimize the cost of sending these messages. So information theory does this kind of analysis of frequencies and so on and it says, okay, if you want to encode this kind of an alphabet with these frequencies, you must have an average bit length of so much. So it gives you a lower bound saying you cannot do better than this. But information theory on its own is not a constructive theory. It doesn't tell you how to achieve that thing. It might say that you can do it in, you can, cannot do it in better than 2.23 bits per letter or whatever, but it will not show you how to do it. So constructing an optimum code and knowing that the optimum code has a certain size are two different things. So in fact, Shannon worked on this problem along with another mathematician called Robert Fano. And they came up with a recursive solution which was different from this, which uses a kind of partitioning of the alphabet. And they came up with something called Shannon-Fano codes. But these Shannon-Fano codes are not optimal. I mean, so with respect to the what could be achieved, they do not always produce the smallest average bit length. So the person who invented Huffman coding, David Huffman, was actually a graduate student at MIT studying this topic under Fano. So he was a student in Robert Fano's class. And Robert Fano assigned this as a term paper. He said either you can write a paper showing how to come up with a optimum code or you can write the final exam. So the story goes that Huffman tried and tried and he was about to give up. So he had almost given up on, on, on this term paper and he was all set to write study for the exam. And then suddenly he came up with this idea which we have now know as Huffman's algorithm. So it was actually a kind of a graduate student who came up with this idea after being told by somebody who tried to prove it and could not prove it. So it's an interesting story and hopefully inspirational for all of us.